Hello. I get to be here all day. I get to introduce the speakers, and I get to watch all their talks as well. Basically, everything is going well. Um, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Kieran, who actually technically has never been a colleague, because we haven't quite managed to work at the same place at the same time, but I feel yeah. like we've overlapped quite a lot professionally. Um, Kieran is a very respected trainer <laughs> and speaker and likes agile things, yeah. Yeah. which makes him sound like a person who mostly talks for a living. Don't underestimate how technical you have to be to be a respected speaker and a respected trainer. Um, it is Kieran's experience, like real hands-on experience, which led me to think that this talk would be a particularly good fit. Some days, being a developer can feel like quite a challenge. And this talk is specifically aimed at teaching us survival skills for that challenge. So, I can't wait. Thanks, Kieran. Thank you. Hello, everyone. <laughs> what an intro, my god. I have to live up to that now. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Kieran. I um, work for this company called Invica. And I do training for teams. And a big part of what I do is uh, coach teams. So I'm supporting our development teams in what they're doing. So we get a lot of opportunities to see different ways of working. We primarily build software for other people. And a lot of the time in these engagements, our team are going to have to go to a customer, sometimes on site, and probably conform with the way that customer's used to doing things, at least initially. Um, and the nature of being an agency is that companies who are doing everything right aren't hiring you. <laughs> it's the companies who have problems who are hiring you. So I get an opportunity to see lots of different ways of being dysfunctional as a, as a development team. <laughs> and something I've uh, noticed when I'm, when I'm supporting these teams, uh, it's very vague, I just say I'm supporting them and pretend that's real work. Um, you can tell a difference in, in how well they perform by how they talk about the project afterwards. So some teams have a kind of negative uh, recall after, after we do a retrospective, and they say, well, that was a complete pile of crap. Uh, that environment was terrible. I'm glad it's over. Uh, another group of people, they come off these projects, and they say, wow, that was terrible. It was great, wasn't it? It's really awful. We had these, they try and impress you with how horrible the situation was, and then they tell you how they fixed it. So something I'm interested in is, is what, why are one group doing really well? well? How are they surviving this experience of being thrown, thrown to the wolves at these customer sites? And actually, they relish it, and they, they get to grips with it, and they, they make things work. And we like that kind of story. Um, we like stuff where someone's stranded and they have to science their way out of it and, and problem solve. Because uh, it feels like something developers are good at, right? problem solving. Um, in this film, it's quite good. He, he says, you know, you just focus on the next task. What's the next problem I have to solve? Don't get overwhelmed by the scope of, of the situation you're in. Just think, you know, what's the next thing that you have to get through? So I started to think, you know, what, what's the next thing for a developer? What are the first steps? Maybe there's a a toolkit we can give people when you're in a crap situation. Solve this thing first. Uh, and it can feel like you're the only person there. Uh, even in a big organization, you might think, I'm the only one with any sense. Uh, I might feel abandoned. I might have to paint a face on a volleyball. Uh, it's called rubber ducking in development. But we really like this kind of story. It's really popular in genre. So there must be something it's tapping into, right? There must be a need inside us. We want to feel like we're, we're going to survive as well. There's real life cases. This is Ada Blackjack. She, uh, she was cast away on an island for two years and survived on her own. You might tell from the picture, it wasn't one of those nice sunny islands. It was just north of Siberia. She had to catch seals and things. So when you're in this survival situation, there are steps you have to follow. You can't, on day one, build a car out of bamboo. You, you know, there's, there's stuff you have to... There's essentials. So what's the equivalent for a, for a developer, maybe? <coughs> and we like to feel like we're prepared. So there's loads of books and TV shows that we're consuming. 
We're never going to be in a survival situation, but we like to feel like we do really well. Um, does anyone know, so you probably already know, right, what are the first things you have to look for when you're dropped in the wilderness? <coughs> Shelter. Shelter. <coughs> Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi password. <laughs> Coffee. Developers. Something like this, right? You need shelter. <coughs> Very good. You need fire, because it, later it will get cold, but you might have to sort out shelter early. You need water, but probably shelter is more important, because you can go a few days without water. Um, and you need food, but maybe not in the first few days. Some of us can go longer uh, than others, because <laughs> we've been sort of saving it up. Um, so I was trying to sort of build a model like this for, for development teams. So the metaphor is obvious. Crappy organizations are like uh, survival situations. There's nasty noises coming from the jungle. Occasionally, beasts rampage through your camp campsite, and, and you want to get through it. What's the first things? So I looked at some different maturity models for learning. Um, there were models of skill acquisition, but they didn't kind of feel right because I wasn't able to build a kind of dependency tree of you have to solve this before you can solve this. There's loads of techniques we can adopt in development. They're all good for you. You don't have to do TDD before you do... Uh, hang on, I can't think of anything. Uh, you have to do TDD first, and then you can do other stuff. Um, but the model that I found chimed most with me, you might be familiar with, is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It might be Maslow. Did anyone ever study psychology? Which one is it? It's Maslow. It's Maslow. Got it right. I only saw it written down. It's one of those things. Um, it's a very uh, popular model. And Abraham Maslow came out with it in the 40s. And what's, what makes this hierarchy of needs different from other kind of step-by-step -step instructions is he was thinking about humans as sort of essential needs. At the base level, what we need to figure out is our uh, physiological problems. Hunger, all those wilderness things. Thirst, I'm on fire, <laughs> that really hurts. But you have to sort those problems first. And if you haven't solved those problems, you can't think about the next level. Once you've solved your physiological problems, you start worrying about safety. I don't want that thing to happen again. Once you feel safe, then you start thinking about love and belonging in a group. And he has this very interesting model of uh, why people focus on different things at, in different environments. Why people who uh, have lots of physiological um, dangers, they're not looking for love. <laughs> they're thinking, I want this fire to go out now. But what was attractive to me is that it, these aren't dependencies. You could look for love while you're hungry. It's a psychological model. It's saying, I can't concentrate on the higher things when I haven't sorted out the lower things. And when you're introducing new practices to organizations, let's take TDD as an example because it's a pet subject. There are kind of three responses you can get. One response is, yes, that's great, let's do it. And that's the boring response, so we won't talk about that one. Another response you can get when you're trying to introduce a new practice to improve things is, sounds good, but we can't do it for these reasons. You know, it, yeah, for our organization, it doesn't work, or we'd have to do this thing first. You know, very practical response, very practical no. And that's easy to deal with because... You can just work through the different factors and solve the other problems first, that kind of thing. And there's a third response, which is a kind of emotional no, where someone says, no, oh, no, that's stupid. Stop banging on about it. You know, it's, you can tell it's not an intellectual response. It's just like, you've, you've pissed me off by even mentioning that we should start doing Agile. Or, you know, mate, uh, uh, what do you mean I shouldn't put all the logic in the control? You're crazy. Get away from me. It's like this emotional thing. So I started to think maybe that's because they've got more immediate problems. And it's not that there are practical reasons we can't adopt this. It's just that they've, their mind is kind of more, much more focused on lower level needs. 
So I thought maybe I'd try and develop a model like this for development teams to try and kind of explain why we might work in different ways at different times and there isn't a kind of right answer. So I talked to lots of developers. Um, if you want to find out what problems developers are having, it's not hard. You get them in a social situation. If they drink alcohol, you give them some of it. And then you say, how's it going at work? Uh, and you get about two or three hours of bitterness, <laughs> anxiety. They tell you all their problems, because we're, we're quite, we're quite uh, quick to do that. So one colleague I was talking to, they're in a very bad situation. It's a nightmare. Nobody knows what they're supposed to be doing or how they're supposed to be doing it. We're constantly chipping on each other's toes. And I've worked in environments like this. There's either no process or there's a process no one understands. So we're not quite sure what we're supposed to be building. I don't know who's working on it. I think Bob did something on that a couple of weeks ago, but I don't know what the status is. Maybe when he gets back from holiday, he'll tell us. Um, Alice also started working on it in parallel, and then they had a conversation where they found out they were both working on the same thing, and then they both stopped. This kind of nonsense. Very dysfunctional processes. So how do you feel when you're in that kind of organization? What are you worried about? Most people in that situation aren't worried about the organization succeeding. They've written that off. They might be worried about their team succeeding, depending how good a team dynamic they are, but really they, they, they start to worry about their own place. They're working and nothing's getting done, and they're kind of starting to work, think, well, how's that reflecting on me? So this is the, the sort of base level need. I want to feel like people inside the organization know that I'm doing a good job. And I'm worried because nothing's getting done, so they might start thinking it's me that's the problem. I may be worried about my job or my next appraisal. So I think this is a good base level. What we're after is visible productivity. We want that thing where someone says, wow, you did a good job this week. This sprint went well. And some teams don't even have that. A lot of the teams I seem to go to don't have that. The ones who are really in trouble. People are doing stuff, they're clocking in, but there's no success or failure. There's no visibility. No one knows how the project's going. Uh, we expect the project to finish in 12 months' time, and we'll probably find out then how it's going <laughs> and how everyone performed. So how do you get visible productivity? There are some shortcuts. Some people can only have, they can just sort of generate the illusion of visible productivity which mostly involves telling people how busy you are and making lots of noise, but let's not go into that because it's probably not satisfying the need inside you. You want to feel like you've done a good job. So the key points are, you need to understand the process you're expected to follow. If you're in this kind of situation, you, you're not going to solve it by affecting process change. You're not going to solve it by fixing the way the organisation worked together. You need to address this immediate problem. I need to show I'm doing a good job. You need to understand what's going to be given to you and what are you going to be expected to deliver. That can be a challenge to understand. And you have to understand how you're going to be measured. You know, what are your performance metrics or your teams? Depending if you feel like you're going it alone or have you got some buddy, buddies who will help you out. Now, none of this is that vital when you're in a well-performing team. I'm saying in this situation where nobody knows what's going on, this is what you need to focus on first. So how do you do that? If, if you Going back to a sort of wilderness metaphor, first thing is sort of map out where, where the hell are we, what's happening, where's the water. You need to come to a shared understanding of what it is you're supposed to be doing and where you are. Um, so we're going to visualize the workflow we're using. This is a concept that's really big in Kanban. But most people aren't in a position where they're a consultant who's been brought in to change the way everyone works. And if you start saying things like, we should start doing Kanban, you'll get 
told off. That's someone else's job to worry about process. So I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about introducing some practices sort of by the back door, casually. So in some engagements, I'm a consultant and get introduced as he's the guy who's going to fix the way we work. And then you can sort of bring out all these keywords and impress people with your certifications you paid for. Um, but even in other contexts, you can just introduce these practices. So the way I tend to do this with teams, when nobody understands the process, is to get some sticky notes and stand near a big flat wall or whiteboard, uh, not in a meeting room, and say, can you just explain to me what the process is? Because I, I read your wiki, and it seems like lots of pages contradicted each other. And uh, I've looked at the process in JIRA, and it doesn't seem to correspond with what we're doing. Can we just talk about it as a, as a little group of people? A tip I got from uh, Matthias Reyes is to do this in a public place. Don't book a room. Uh, and do it near the people who you want to sort of draw into the conversation. People who would have rejected your meeting invitation, but if you're doing it on a wall near them, they'll come over and take part and say, no, that's wrong. So I try and do it near a team lead of another, another squad or near some of the developers or near the testers. So they'll overhear what you're doing and notice you're saying it wrong and come and, come and fix it. And just kind of casually say, OK, so we develop software. What happens after that? This is just an example. OK, then we do quality control. Maybe, someone else, maybe no one knows what happens after that. You have to go and grab someone else. Can you explain what happens next? We do some sort of user acceptance testing, and then we deploy it. This is a simplified example. It's not a recommendation of a workflow. I'm just saying you map. You map, map what's happening already. And then go the other way. How do you know what to develop? Who gives it to you? This is a good conversation to have. What, who are the individuals involved? Who briefs things into you? What kind of formats do you get it in? And you can end up sort of understanding the pipeline from someone has an idea and says, yeah, we should do that, to software goes out. So your process might be much simpler. Um, might be much more complex. This is from one customer. We ended up doing two whiteboards. And there's about 20 stages an item goes through. Because they have a scaled agile process that they got from somewhere. So this can have a profound effect on the teams. The team I did this with, nobody knew what they were supposed to be working on. Things were getting left on the shelf. Nobody understood what was happening. And nobody really knew what they were supposed to be doing next. Crucially, all of this stuff was documented. There's a new starters handbook all about it. There's a bunch of wiki pages saying this is our process, but everyone had just kind of understood a small amount. Another outcome you have from this kind of practice is you often find out where the real process differs from the documented one. Oh, yeah, it says that in the process, but we never do that. We actually just quit email someone. So map the, the real process. And then as you can see here, just that initial mapping makes sense to understand what we're doing. You can then say, OK, the stuff you're working on, can you just put a sticky in a different color underneath it? And just so we understand where it is in the workflow. This is probably already, this visual, literally this visual, visualization might already be somewhere hidden in JIRA somewhere or a different ticketing system. But the act of making it yourself with the team they start to feel like they are in this process. They start to feel like it's something we built on a whiteboard, which is very different to it's something the project manager set up for us and then gave to us to fill in. And of course, very typically, different people in the team know different parts of the process. So everyone getting a big overview of where the work we're doing is, it is good. So the next step in this context is a temporary one. This isn't a good agile practice, but it's what you do when you're in this chaotic situation I described, is you then sort of build a fence around your safe space. You build a safe area for your team to operate in. You build a wall. Oh, God. 
Yeah. You build a wall and get the client to pay for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is a wall that you hope to knock down in future. I should stress that. But you need to say, okay, this is my team. This is what we're being measured on. Our starting point has to be making this team successful and visibly productive. So we, went, we go through a process of identifying which of these columns do we care about? Which of the columns are we being measured on? And this changes the perspective. Instead of thinking, wow, I feel bad because we never deploy anything in this company, you still feel bad for the company, but you think, but my team's really good at developing and testing things. And that our cycle time here can get really short. And we can focus initially on getting really good at this bit. This is what we're going to get good at. Back to the same project, the red areas are where work was, where that stage of the process was, was being done outside the team. And for this team, this was kind of a revelation because they'd been worried about, it's taking us a really long time to get stuff from the left to the right and loads of it's out of our control. We said to them, don't worry about it. You need to focus on getting stuff here to, from here to here quickly, from here to here quickly, and from here to here quickly. And if it's stacking up in these columns, don't worry about it yet. Yet. To fix that, we'll have to influence other teams. But let's get our team working. An important thing that happens here is these five or six stages you have to go through, the organization doesn't care. You can do something much simpler, as long as you're getting from here to here. You can find something that works better for your team. So this visualization and understanding what those boundaries are gives a team a much, much more flexibility in how they work. The next thing to worry about is what's happening at these boundaries. Who is it who's giving you work at each boundary? Make sure everyone in the team understands. When something's done, who does it go to? What does it have to look like for that person to be happy? When something comes back, what's it going to look like? Who's it going to come from? Do we understand where work's been briefed in? What we actually did with this team, you, we, we found out basically there's three separate workflows for three different types of things. So these are requirements being turned into designs. These are like designs being turned into software. And this is a sort of software plus test plan gets tested through different layers of integration tests. And we ended up reorganizing the board and stacking these three, three different workflows on top of each other. So for the team, it became a load of different types of things on the left are going through parallel separate workflows until they're done on the right. And on the right, they get sent to someone else. That kind of team selfishness is not good on the bigger scale, but you, you might need to develop it so your team feel like they're being productive and uh, are visibly productive to the organization they're in. So you have to understand the inputs and outputs. So the mode, the collaborative mode a team will be in when they're using this kind of model is not a good agile collaborative mode. It's a mode that teams and dysfunctional organiza organizations fall into anyway. Uh, they say things like, just tell me what it is you want me to build. Has anyone heard that? Who said it recently? And that's the frustration, right? That we're problem solvers. We want to solve problems, but we'll say, actually, no, you solve the problem. Just tell me what the solution looks like, and I'll implement it for you. And you see it a lot in organizations where there's a lot of dysfunction, a lot of um, lack of process. So the mode here is to really try and understand the stuff that's coming in. Do I understand it? Does it have enough information? I'm going to ask clarifying questions. I'm going to make sure acceptance criteria are written down with whoever's briefing it in and optimize that process of briefing and requirements. I have to understand the definition of done. I have to understand when I deliver it, what am I expected to deliver? Am I delivering code? Am I delivering tested code? Am I delivering tested code with loads of documentation and a deployment script? You know, what's the output? 
and get really good at that. This is a, a business and a developer. So they've got some ideas, and the business has some idea and some metrics they want to change. You want to make more money or spend less money. or It's normally money, if we're honest. They've got some kind of outcome they want from the feature. And they brief in a bunch of requirements. Um, examples of how the system should behave. You can use the BDD practices of deriving examples as a good way of making this much clearer. Writing out scenarios. Here's exactly what the system should do. And when you're just trying to get good at being productive, the developer's job is to, un is to say, did I understand those requirements? Checking that I understood them. So by focusing just on the bit, understanding really well how we measured, what parts of the process are we measured on, what's coming into our team, what's coming out of our team, and getting better at that, increasing the cycle time, that's how you're going to get to a state where you're visibly productive. So we have conversations like, well, the organization is still a massive mess, but that team is really motoring through uh, the features they're building. They're doing really well, but I mean, the project's screwed. But that team are doing really well. And they're going home at the end of the day, at the end of the sprint, thinking, wow, we smashed it that sprint. Our velocity is crazy. We're feeling better. So we've taken care of that need. They have to be visibly productive. So are they happy then? Probably not. I spoke to another colleague, <coughs> former colleague, I should say. And she'd gone to a company that their development team was like a really well-tuned engine. They were using these cool new frameworks. It was a couple of years ago, and it was JavaScript, so there might not be cool new frameworks anymore. <laughs> I love JavaScript, sorry. Um, and you know, I'm working with this, these tools that I really like. Everyone's working together really well. The team really meshes. Uh, but I hate it there. I'm going to leave. Why is that? It's because I've been there for 18 months, and we haven't actually delivered any software yet. We've been working. This is a real example. She'd been working on this new product for 18 months, and no, no customers had used it. And they had a backlog extending out into the distance. They wanted to have released it, but they had issues. So the next need I think we have as developers is we want to deliver working software. We want to make software well. You get a lot of satisfaction from being a productive person who builds stuff. But then you want it to be out in the wild and used. So how can you affect that? Essentially, now, now we've built our sort of perimeter fence, we're going to go through a process of expanding the fence downstream from us until everyone's part of our well-working team. And you can only do that step by step. You can't say to the entire organization, we're working really well together. All of you join us. You kind of figure out, now we understand our workflow. What's the next step in the workflow? And can we bring those into the team? Maybe the next group is UAT. So we got really good at the development of QA, but UAT takes a long time. Let's start regarding UAT as part of our boundary, part of our workflow. So to do this, you have to change the way you're measuring success. If your definition of done before was tested software, it's now going to be tested software that passed UAT. Or whatever the next step is, you change your basis of measurement in a deliberate way. You're going to focus more on finishing stuff. Don't focus. I started loads of things today. It's not really a good outcome. It's not really a good update in the stand-up. Yeah, I started loads of things. It's, really, it's much better to say, yeah, I finished these features. So if we're, if we're adopting a new part of the process as part of our workflow, we've got to start with what are the things on the right that haven't been finished yet? Those are the things that have had the most investment. 
the most time and energy have been put into them, and we haven't finished yet. So they're kind of the biggest sunk cost. Those are the things we need to focus on first. So if we've decided deliberately to, maybe we weren't including testing before, if we decided to include testing, we have to all as a team really care that there's a load of stuff in the testing column. And we're going to focus first on how can we finish that. You might not organizationally be able to bring the people responsible for these other parts of the process into your team, but you can talk to them and build a relationship with them and understand what they're doing and help them. So you can do what the sort of developer superpower, which is I can automate some of the boring crap you have to do. We do it for our customers. Why don't we do it for the people downstream from us? Often it's because we're focusing on being visibly productive. Once everyone knows you're doing a good job, you can start saying, OK, how can I help out the testing team? How can I help out the deployment team? By understanding, by anticipating what their needs are going to be from talking to them, we can make sure stuff's bundled up in a way that's going to be the most convenient for them. And we're going to help automate some of their tasks. So for example, if you weren't previously integrated between dev and testing, get to know the testing team. Ask them how they test features. Here's some stuff you can do. Discuss the features earlier. Bring testers into the requirements phase if they're not there already. Make sure you understand the feature in the same way they do. This is going to stop misalignment between what you've built and what it's supposed to be. Unfortunately, this all involves human interaction, which we're all bad at. It's OK. Um, design the testing strategy together. So this, isn't, this doesn't have to be like a big, when I say design, people imagine a big document. You sit and say, how would you test this? The tester will say, oh, I'd, I'd repetitively click through all these bits. And then I'd do some exploratory testing here. And then I probably wouldn't test that bit. It's probably low priority. Because test, testing professionals have a lot of heuristics about you know, what, where's the risk, what's the most important thing to test. So by having that conversation, you can anticipate and say, well, I do this TDD thing anyway, so I can ship you the automated tests for those things that you said were boring. I can make your life easier. And I actually, maybe I don't need to write automated tests for those bits you just told me don't, aren't likely to break. By collaborating more, you're going to solve, save some time for yourself. But also, you, by shipping stuff to the testers with tests, and the tests, the tests that are designed so they kind of trust you, you can optimize that part. And then because the testing team are inside your boundary, you can blur the lines in the process a little bit more. So we can have a conversation like, instead of me building this entire massive feature, and then like moving it to the next column, is there a way I could build part of it, and then you could test it? And then I build another part, and you test that. And each time, you're just checking the other stuff hasn't broken. If you're driving that process, the tester's going to say, no, you have to deliver it to me. And I'll test it independently. If you've got a collaborative, empathic relationship with them, you're going to come up with something between you. And every day, you'll be able to ship them a bit of extra software that they can test, and it all goes through nicely. Similar thing with um, operations people. <laughs> we tried to invent a word for developers and operations collaborating, but it got changed <laughs> to mean operations. So we need developers to talk to the DevOps people. Uh, we can call it Dev DevOps. So it's the same sort of process. You deliberately say, you change your basis of measurement. So you say, only deployed things count as done from now on. We're only going to crack open the champagne or buy the fancy cake when stuff's deployed. We're going to stop doing it when it's just, you know, someone's written a script. Um, so you have to chat to those people, understand what it is they do. Similar to the testers, bring them earlier into the requirements conversation. I'm building this new feature, and it's going to need a graph database. Maybe I should mention that now, <laughs> rather than after I've finished it, throw it over the wall to you. Um, or, you know, it's got a massive data migration that you're going to only be able to do next March when we take the servers offline. 
only by discussing with the people who are actually going to have to do that part of the process are you going to be able to understand how you can bundle stuff up in the most efficient way. Reflecting your deployment strategy locally is really crucial. So if you're using Chef to deploy uh, on production, you should probably use Chef to deploy to your virtual machine, that kind of thing. If you're using Docker in production, you should probably start looking at using Docker locally. And that's a collaboration between you and the DevOps people. Using the same scripts to deploy locally means you'll, when you break stuff that breaks the deployment, you'll find out locally, and then you'll go and ask for their help, and they'll help you because you know each other. You bought them a coffee that time. You've built the relationship. And almost inevitably, like with testing, you'll, you'll find repetitive steps that can be automated together. For testers, it might be as well as writing automated tests, it might be something like, I keep having to set up new environments. I don't have a way to clear the database. Things that you can script because you're a developer. With operations people, maybe there's a way that my code and your deployment scripts can be more integrated. We can work better together. So then you've got some working software. I'm really productive, I get home every day, I've stopped worrying about people thinking I'm unproductive because we ship software once a week or once a day or a few times a day or every commit I make goes onto the production server after the test run. You've, do you've done that continuous delivery thing. Maybe you're happy. Maybe not. So another colleague was actually working for a really good company. They're doing continuous deployment. Everyone's collaborating all the way. They've got DevOps culture embedded into what they're doing. Why aren't you happy? It's because nobody really cares about this product. We're, um, we're, building, we're releasing new software you know, almost daily. We're constantly iterating. The end users tell us it's crap. And actually, they prefer the old system. We keep, they keep sneaking onto the legacy system and, and processing stuff through that. So how does that happen? And I'm worried because I'm building software, but maybe my self-esteem's taking a drop, and I'm thinking, well, I'm, I'm just building crap every day. I'm doing it well. <laughs> like really efficient production. Because we want to deliver, we actually do want to deliver value to people. Something, development's about problem solving, but it is also about having someone say, wow, that's really changed, changed my life. I'm not saying we all need to go and work for companies that are solving famine or that kind of problem, but there's a satisfaction of saying, well, I've made someone's life better. I've made it, even if it's like I've made a cool thing and they used it and they enjoyed it, their life has got better. So to deliver value, we have to switch around a little bit. We have to care what the software is for. We have to break out of the just tell me what it's supposed to do mindset. And we need to care about what's happening upstream of us in the workflow. And it's a similar sort of process. You don't overnight change an organization. You just look at what's our upstream boundary and let's push it a little bit. Let's get more involved in whoever the next step is. Let's push into those areas of UX and business analysis, and maybe even business strategy. Let's push upwards. And like with Maslow's hierarchy, this is a need that only emerges when you've kind of got the other stuff. When I'm worried about being visible, I just want someone to tell me what to build. When I'm worried about the software getting out there, I, I'm not really getting involved in why we're building stuff. Many organizations have a UX step first, and it's often driven by the developers. I'm only going to work on this if there's lots of wireframes attached to the ticket, and it's really clear what I'm expected to build and expected to deliver. That's defensiveness. So collaborate upstream. Get more involved in the UX design first, if that's how your pipeline is working. So to, to really succeed at this, you have to understand the value behind things. And this is a core thing in Agile. User stories are designed to convey the value of the software you're producing. 
but often we don't talk about it enough. So developers need to understand the value of the software. Developers need to start to engage with come up with solutions. So instead of tell me what it's supposed to do, you say, tell me what problem this is going to solve and what ideas have you had so far about how we could solve it. And I'm going to help you refine that idea and maybe I'll come up with some other ideas you haven't even thought of because there's a cool technology that does it that you didn't even know about. Um, to achieve this, you need to expose metrics to developers, especially when your, your deployment problems have been solved. As well as understanding why we're doing things, we can nail down how we're going to measure if it succeeded and get developers interested in how those metrics are changing. And we need to engage with real users. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is that it is the best way to understand the value the software is going to deliver, is to understand who's going to be using it. The other is for the developers to get satisfaction of having a relationship with the people who use the software and get told, well done, that, that worked. That little button you added has saved me hours. Thank you so much, here's a coffee. That kind of relationship building with end users. On a very large like B2C type basis, that might not be possible. You might be able to get a user subgroup Often with B2B, you might know all the users of your software. <laughs> I spent four years working on a system that had about 80 users. So it's a different conversation. It's a better conversation. It's a better collaboration. So the business comes up with ideas and comes up with metrics. There, there always is a, a metric that the business is trying to affect. They just forget to tell you. We're not just coming up with features for no reason. We're not just doing this project for no reason because we want a new website. Someone said, we need a new website because it's going to increase our profits. And they convinced the rest of the board to invest hundreds of thousands of pounds because it's going to drive our profits up. And then everyone forgets to tell the developers it's about increasing profit <laughs> or what the real metrics are. So when you're having this collaborative conversation, the business might not explain those things. They might still come out with a set of requirements. I want a green button in the corner, and when I click on it, this is what happens. And they forget to tell you why. So the job of the developer is then to, to try and understand these rules and feedback and say, okay, it sounds like there's a kind of evolution. The requirement might be, we need a new checkout. Why do you need a new checkout? Because the old one's slow. Ah. Sounds like you want a faster checkout. Yes, that's right. So you're having a feedback loop. Fast is different to new. Um, why do you want a fast and checkout process? It's because um, Bob, the analytics guy, was talking to uh, Alice, the business analyst, and he happened to mention that we have a lot of abandoned baskets, and we think if it was faster to check out, we'd have fewer people abandoning their purchases. Ah, so you want a faster checkout, because then people won't abandon their baskets, and then we'll make more money. Now I've added a whole load of constraints to the, the solution that the developer might not have known about. I could have made a new checkout that's slow and uh, makes less money for us. So actively trying to understand that as a developer is something eventually you get to. You can't do it if you're worried about being productive. It seems like extra time. If you're, if you're coming from a place of confidence, it's easier to have this kind of value-driven conversation. And then how are we going to measure it? Let's set up a report in Google Analytics that tells us how many baskets got abandoned. And after I do the commit and the thing automatically deploys it, we can watch the needle and see if it goes up or down. We'll do A-B testing. And actually, the developers have a load of other ideas about how we could reduce the number of abandoned baskets that we can have a conversation about. If they don't have the confidence, they're not going to engage that way. But this is where you can get to. Developers generating requirements. That's probably the most mature model. So as well as receiving requirements and clarifying requirements, you're trying to reach up the chain. You're saying, why do you want that thing? Why is it important to you? Asking questions about value, not just clarification questions. And in those sessions, you can expand and offer new examples. OK, so you've. You've added a few acceptance criteria. I think this is also an acceptance criteria. What do you think? It becomes much more of a back and forth conversation. 
And offering alternatives is probably something developers can add to this process. If you're just receiving wireframes and that's locked, it's hard to offer alternatives. If you're being given an idea of how we're going to implement stuff and the value behind it, you can say, actually, that's really good, but there's this new browser API. You should go to Drew's talk later. There's a new browser API that just does that for you. Or there's this thing called Apple Pay. We can just like click the button. We don't have to integrate anything. Or you can offer solutions that the business hasn't heard of. Business experts often aren't technology experts, and they won't be able to identify the solutions that are going to solve the problems. And something we've been pushing for recently is exposing metrics to development teams. One project we had recently, um, the coach on that project really drove to get metrics attached to every ticket. It's a, very metric, it's a publication, it's very metrics driven. So we knew this user story is actually about increasing the number of articles a person reads when they visit our website. And the day after we deployed that feature, the team on their uh, chat channel were posting links to the Google Analytics and getting excited that it's going up. One of them, on his own time, went away and made a slide deck uh, of how the before and after and how it had changed and then presented it. We presented that back out to the company. That kind of in engagement from developers doesn't happen on day one. But it happens when they really understand what they're supposed to be building. It happens when they know they're trusted to develop things well. That's when they know the stuff they're developing is going to be used soon. When you're developing things that are going to be used in 12 months, you forget that humans exist who are going to use it because it seems so abstract and far away. So when you get shorter deployment times, you start being much more engaged with users. You have hallway conversations where they say, that thing you did yesterday is really good. <laughs> I used it this morning. So that kind of face-to-face -face feedback is, is sort of the last component. Get to know some of the people who use your software. And it's not even about getting feedback from them. It's about having a face-to-face -face relationship or a human relationship with them. So even outside of you know, UX testing, you're thinking about the per You know the person who's going to use it in a kind of fuzzy way. So when you do all that stuff, you stop worrying about being productive and valued at work. You start feeling like you're building stuff that's actually used. And then you see that stuff being used and delivering the value it was supposed to deliver. The projects I get asked to work on, we get to hear sometimes. Like I said, as an agency, you get called into people with problems. The people who are doing it really well don't call you in. So I'm not sure what the next layer up is. I'm not sure what you start worrying about when you've consistently been delivering value for months and months. I think it might be to do with sustainability. But I'm looking forward to, to finding out. So that's it. I'm Kieran. I work for this company called Invica, as does Sam, who's speaking next. We have offices in Sheffield and Leeds. Uh, so if your business is in this area, we can help you, or you can come and work for us, or you can do some training or coaching, so come and talk to us. I organise a meetup called BDU London, which is far away, but we have an active Slack group if you want to join it. And I maintain a tool called PHP Spec, so grab me if you want to talk about it. But thank you very much. <laughs>